Good afternoon. We are Team 12. My name is Martin Stratus. Jackson Tate, please. Sebastian Morales. And we are doing a solar power radio control aircraft, and our advisor is also done this demo. Our problem statement was to design, optimize, and manufacture to build a 12 foot solar power efficient way. Uh, one of our motivations for this project was to design an eco friendly aircraft, manufacture a low cost, uh, continuously operating UAV, and we also wanted to incorporate and work out with the Aerospace Engineering Club here at school. So our objectives was to achieve a sustained solar power flight, reduce the cost of manufacturing uh, an aircraft of these characteristics, and to determine the best configuration using composites such as fiberglass and uh, carbon fiber. So our solar cells are monocrystalline. We chose monocrystalline cells because of their low cost, high efficiency, and ability in the market. We decided to go with uh, 50, solar, 50 solar cells in total, so 25 on each side of the wing. And our cells were connected in series and parallel. We did some initial testing, actually, and um, we got 132 watts compared to what we wanted. We, in order to achieve sustained solar power flight, we wanted 200 watts. Um, we were expecting 170, so we got 132, and this probably happened because of the, some of the, some of our during manufacturing some of our solar cells um, cracked a little bit, and but then it's pretty good. To what we <coughs> so in order for us to choose the best configuration of solar cells and the best one that we wanted to, we decided to buy three solar cells off the market, and we we bought them off of China. It took them a, a, a quite a bit of time to, to get to us. And then we did some initial testing at different times of the day with different weather conditions, and we chose the best one that we got the most amount of power. Basically, on this table, you can see solar number two is the, the most efficient one that we chose. Our motor and propeller, we chose uh, ECOM. It's a model optimization software that gave us the best motor configuration and propeller that we wanted to use. So we optimized it for 200 watts because that's what we wanted to achieve um, same solar power flight. And we also wanted to incorporate a gearbox because of our airplane goes at low RPMs and will give us a higher torque. So we did that and, and our propeller is fairly large and it's better for productivity and also it bends because once we landed, we wanted to rebel land it. So in order not to break the propeller, we decided to go with a full here is our motor selection. Um, as you can see, here we got 2796 using ePower software. When we did our static testing, not in this slide, but we got 2770, so it's pretty good to what we expected it to, to be. Uh, RPM, so pretty good. And then our design constraints, we had a limited budget, limited time, low operating power. We wanted to maintain the low weight. Actually, right now we're looking at 16 pounds. Originally, originally we wanted 13 tons, so we're fairly good there, and we have limited energy from the sun. All right, so I'm going to talk about some of the design specifications. One of the largest problems with having a solar-powered aircraft is that you have to power the craft with a limited amount of energy. So basically, from our solar power, if we had a perfectly efficient plane uh, with absolutely no cracking, no blemishes on the solar power elements, we'd be getting around 200 watts of power. Um, to put this into perspective, we fly a eight-foot uh, wingspan aircraft for the SAE Aero Design Competition on a thousand watts of power. So we had to make this plane extremely uh, aerodynamically efficient. So uh, we wanted a very hard, high lift-to-drag ratio, which was achieved with a glider type configuration and our selection of airfoils. Uh, and we, really, we wanted to focus on the high efficiency both in the electric components with the solar cells and also with the aerodynamics. We considered a number of design alternatives. Many of them are not shown here, just due to time, due time constraints. Um, we considered originally a traditional tail, to, tail design, as shown here, where you have the horizontal stabilizer at the root. Some of the advantages to this design were that it was easier to build and it was a stronger um, design at the root. But when trying to land the plane, if you belly land it, there's a possibility of damaging the horizontal tail because it's come into contact with the ground. And we also ended up losing aerodynamic efficiency because the wash coming off of the main wings would affect the uh, aerodynamics around the horizontal tail, which decreased our efficiency by around 30 to 40 percent that we found in simulations. By choosing a T-tail uh, design, we raise the 
elevation of the horizontal tail out of the wash of the main wing, and we no longer have to worry about damaging the tail during landings. Some of the airfoil optimization or uh, selection analysis was done using XFLR5, which is a low Reynolds RC scale uh, aerodynamic and basic CFD analysis tool that was developed by Mark Drela from MIT. We considered mostly the WE355 9.3 airfoil, which is what we ended up using, uh, a number of SA7000 series airfoils, and also the HQ3000 and 2500 series airfoils. Um, for our design. For our design alternatives for the airfoils, we, uh, as I said before, we use XFLR5. Uh, XFLR5 is very good at giving decently accurate data and doing comparative analysis studies. The exact values are not what you're going to actually see, but it's good for choosing between different designs. So we basically did an optimization approach where we would run a certain number of airfoils against each other and choose the best ones based on different parameters. Uh, some of those included the angle of attack, the Reynolds value, and uh, sites of conditions and other uh, parameters like that. And from that, we tested through around 35 airfoils, and we ended up choosing the WB355 airfoil, which had an average CLCD, which is the lift to drag coefficient ratio, of 75. So when we were doing the structural analysis for our airplane, we wanted to make sure that our plane remained relatively lightweight, because this affected our aerodynamic performance. Um, in our initial design, we inspect a 16-foot wingspan, which was a much higher efficiency aircraft, but was also going to be heavier and much, diff much more difficult to build. Uh, because we were working with a grant from NACME, who graciously donated $5,000 to us to complete this project, uh, we were waiting for the funding to come in before we could purchase materials and test um, our composite layups and do the manufacturing. Unfortunately, this money didn't come in until about a month and a half after we expected it to, so we had to change our design to meet our manufacturability needs. We ended up scaling down to a 12-foot wingspan, where you can see the values here. So one of the key parameters for aircraft performance is the wing loading. Um, in our initial design, we had a 13.824 ounce per square foot wing loading, and we increased that to 20.736. So this is a worse performing plane than our initial design one, but we wouldn't have a plane if we hadn't scaled it down. So I think this was a, a valuable engineering compromise. For the wing loading analysis, we considered the beam, the wings as cantilever stressed skin um, designs for composite beams. And this was our basic analysis done to compare a structural beam uh, compared to a stressed skin design. So as you can see, the max loading for a structural beam was 38 megapascal. In here, it was 185 kilopascal. So our loads are much lower, which means it's easier to design for. The actual analysis was done using composite, composite laminate beam theory where we took the uh, wings as a rectangular cross-section shown here of 13.3 inches by 1 inch. Uh, with our fiber material properties there, we were able to calculate how many layers we would need and then do analysis based on that to determine whether there would be failure. Because we knew we weren't going to be doing aerospace grade manufacturing for this project, we actually factored in an extremely large factor of safety. During our aerodynamic calculation, we used a 1.5 acceleration factor, so 1.5 loading um, uh, above what our static loading would be, which is our expected flight parameters. For the analysis, we used a 3G loading, which is twice of that, and then we used a factor of safety of two. So our final uh, layup ended up being four layers of uni or three layers of unidirectional, and a layer of 45-45 at the on the outside, which was to prevent shear and delamination and also deal with uh, torsion in the wing. The wing joining design, as you saw when we joined the wings, there are two recessed aluminum tubes inside of the wing at the 25% and the 63% cord line. Uh, the main load is transferred along the 25% cord line here, which is where our aerodynamic center of pressure is. Uh, so the first tube holds most of the bending and shear moment, or shear uh, loads, and then the last tube is mostly for uh, counteracting the moment produced by the aerodynamics of the wing. The final design uh, incorporates a wingspan of 12 feet. We have a cord root here at the base of the aircraft of 16 inches and a tip root of 10 inches. Uh, we have a horizontal tail that is four feet long with a cord at the root of eight inches and at the tip of five inches. So here are uh, some of the standards uh, we follow. Uh, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers for Design and Safety Codes. Uh, the FAA restricts us from flying the aircraft within five miles of an airport without prior notice. Uh, the American Society of Testing and Materials for the proper testing of all these materials that we use. 
and uh, the IEEE uh, for the proper use of the solar cells, and the Academy of Model Aeronautics required us to uh, be registered before flying the aircraft. Uh, the manufacture of these aircraft, we divided it into four uh, main sections. We started with the fuselage. Um, uh, we made it out of home first. We cut it with a, a hot wire. Then we started with uh, one layer of uh, fiberglass, then unidirectional carbon fiber on the top and bottom layers, unidirectional for uh, the holding of the wings as well, and then one last layer of unidirectional uh, fiberglass. We inserted it into a vacuum bag, uh, for uh, which we compressed for the holding of all uh, the laser composite. Then we went on to the empanage. Uh, for the tail, we used uh, one layer of unidirectional carbon fiber along the uh, 25 first uh, side core line. Uh, then we uh, use 45-45 uh, carbon fiber on the entire uh, vertical, and we did the same thing for the horizontal side layer. Uh, for the wings, we use uh, four layers of unidirectional carbon fiber, uh, mainly on roots, uh, on both uh, top and bottom layers. We cover it uh, entirely with 45-45 carbon fiber. Again, we use, uh, insert it into the vacuum bags to compress uh, all the composite and ensure that they would stick to the entire surface. Um, then, for the electrical components, we uh, added them all after the manufacturing of each section, except on, on the wings, in which we inserted all the wiring board, uh, the mortar, uh, the propeller, the battery, and the telemetry system went into the fuselage, and we cut hatches uh, for all of the servos and, and wiring for so here's some, uh, well, for our solar cells, actually we uh, attach them to the wings with uh, epoxy. We also use a captain tape on all of them for, uh, to prevent uh, contact with the carbon fiber since uh, it's conductive. And then uh, we insert it into a vacuum bag as well just to ensure that the shape of, uh, uh, it will stick to the shape of the uh, airflow of the wings. Uh, for uh, global design components, we can operate this aircraft in in the entire globe since we have uh, sunlight everywhere. Uh, we did a multilingual, multilingual user's manual in uh, English, Spanish, and French. Uh, our components were sourced globally from China, for example, that are sold ourselves. Uh, our motor is from the UK. And then we recycle a lot of materials like the carbon fiber, which we're going to use for further research. Uh, here's some of the contemporary issues that we face today. Uh, our aircraft is capable to perform the same as uh, Facebook uh, Aquila, if I'm correct. Uh, we are, it has the capability to, for example, uh, provide internet to uh, other regions of the world. Uh, it could be used for surveillance. Uh, you can incorporate a, a camera in the front and uh, use it to help the police. Uh, forest fires, you can incorporate an infrared camera in the front and prevent forest fires or detect them. Uh, here are some uh, of the li lifelong learning experiences. We learn to collaborate with other engineering disciplines, mainly with uh, electrical engineering, which, which were a huge help with the solar uh, panel. Uh, we learned a lot about, about, uh, about uh, aerospace structures. As you can see, this is a huge aircraft, and we need to do a lot of calculations and simulations for this project. Uh, we, need, uh, we did a lot of uh, 3D uh, modeling simulations, a lot of finite element analysis and computational fluid dynamics. And we learned to work as a team, not only between the three of us, but with the collaboration of the Aerospace Engineering Club. Uh, here's the, the division of our responsibilities. It is, it is important to know that each we, uh, we help with every single component of this aircraft. And here is highlight uh, until today. So for the cost analysis, as my friend Jackson mentioned before, we had we were fortunate enough to receive a five thousand dollar grant from NACI, which is a green technology grant. Basically, they gave it to projects that are uh, sustainable projects. We spent thirty five hundred dollars on this project. Uh, we our projected cost was about forty seven hundred. We saved fourteen hundred dollars, which gives us a twenty eight percent. Uh, savings percentage. Here you can see the cost distribution. Most of our costs came from the solar cells and the composites, which includes the foam molds, which, as mentioned before, uh, one of the reasons that we weren't able to fly the plane yet was because the foam molds for the winds took a very long time to get to us. We outsourced them. 
since it was a custom airfoil, it, it took about two months to get to us. So we were running really tight on time for us to be able to fly. In conclusion, in conclusion, we did not achieve the same flight. We hope to achieve the same flight. Um, right now, our, our design is a little bit tail heavy. So what we plan on doing, we plan on extend the fuselage a little bit, uh, add another uh, extension of it in order to bring it back to balance. We use composites. We learned about composites, how to lay them up. And we successfully analyze and design the aircraft. To secure funding for this aircraft, it took a very long time to find $5,000 to, to be able to complete this project. So we received the grant. And in future work, we plan on obviously flying the aircraft. And also, we want to use uh, incorporate winglets. We also want to look at different ways of uh, propulsion system. We're thinking about compressor, tank. And we want to also reduce the weight by maybe using the hollow wings. Um, considering that you guys are part of the aerospace team or the aerospace club, why wasn't winglets being considered from the get-go? So winglets were considered from the get-go. Ultimately, we didn't end up using them because of cost and magic, well, not cost, but manufacturing constraints. Um, because most of our molds were done with aluminum or with foam cores, we didn't want to hand shape uh, extremely complex geometry such as a winglet, and we couldn't find someone who could manufacture the shape of the winglet um, within our budget and within our time constraints um, for the winglets that we designed. Winglets would have helped a lot with uh, the tip turbulence at the tips of the wings, and actually the way we sized our ailerons were based on where the turbulence come, came over and it touched the top surface, so we didn't want any of that attaching or affecting our control surfaces. But we ultimately didn't end up using it because our very taper ratio and the aspect ratio of the wings when we did our initial design with the 16 foot wingspan, we barely had any turbulence anyway. So it seems like the excess weight wasn't worth the cost of the investment and the time it would have taken to do a full analysis of the movements. Uh, we're going, I'm going to be graduating next semester. Uh, my two teammates are going on into industry this semester. I'm extremely proud of them, but I will be continuing research now, with this plane, hopefully doing winglet optimization, uh, if we can find funding, we're also going to be looking at a hollow molded wing instead of a foam core on that sandwich. Um, have you guys considered why planes aren't made out of carbon fiber, or at least bare carbon fiber? So, most of the issue is in delamination, but also the, the elements. A lot of the problems with carbon fiber is that you have UV exposure, and it messes up the resin matrix, and then you have degradation of the fiber, which leads to delamination, failure to composite, and the lower overall structural strength. Um, most of the reason we use bare carbon fiber is because we don't have high access to very proficient and advanced methods of composite manufacturing, which was one of the main problems we had with this craft. Um, we've never done a composite structure of this scale before, and it was a huge learning process. So by the time we got to the wings and everything else, you know, we just kind of wanted it to, to work. Uh, we're planning on covering the outside with something called Ultra Coat. It's like a clear shrink wrap film. It's very lightweight. Uh, it, we actually have it on the fuselage here on the tail. I don't know if you can see it. But we hope that that will help deal with UV issues and then also help um, reduce the friction of the outside skin. <coughs> One last question. You guys said you needed 200 uh, watts of power to yeah. successfully yeah. run your plane. That was at the 16 foot size wingspan, right? Actually, that was with the 12 foot wingspan. So you guys designed something for 1200, 200 watts, expected 170, and they got 130. Yes. How? So, so we went how would you present that to someone who's asking you to build this product? So the, that you're at what? We went and incorporated a, a battery on it. Uh, we we knew for a fact that we weren't going to be able to slowly power the solar cells. So that's why we said 200 watts for sustained solar power flight. 170 we expected from the solar cells. We're getting 132. And the rest was going to be a lipo battery. So the, the, to add to that, the main reason we were expecting, or we said we needed 200 watts, is because all of the initial sizing of the aircraft was done with the 16-foot wingspan in mind. So the estimated power, uh, while it was scaled down for the 12-foot wingspan, we lost a lot of aerodynamic efficiency, which means we had uh, a lower lift-to-drag ratio, and we had an increased amount of drag. Therefore, we needed a higher ratio of power from the motor, which we couldn't get from the 12-foot wingspan. 
So like we said in the presentation, we made the decision to scale down the wings to 12 foot sections instead of 16 foot, um, just because we wanted to be able to manufacture the plate. It won't be capable of continuous sustained flight, but because we do have a large battery in reserve, we can still get flights based on our calculations, even with 132 watts, of around four or five hours. Okay, I just, to me, if you make a design change, and your design doesn't close, you don't start manufacturing. Uh, we had a limited time, we had a li yeah. limited amount of time, and for here at FIU at least, we're required to build something for our senior design. So we wanted to bring this experience not just to ourselves, but also to the Aerospace Engineering Club, and we feel that the research we've done now and everything we've learned in manufacturing and all of the struggles and issues we've had yeah, building yeah. this plane is extremely beneficial to the rest of uh, the club and FIU in general. So, coming in defense of the 787 Dreamliner, which I've worked with for <laughs> six years, uh, carbon fiber is perfectly fine, and you guys did a pretty good job. One of the things, before I even think about winglets, which is a the Achilles heel of the 737 MAX, which I did work with in development of the winglets, is the simulation of them. And if you don't preserve the flight profile of the wing, forget about the winglets. You, you can forget about that. Uh, as I've seen right now, the uh, the solar cells, though they're per they're perfectly placed in the wing, but I can see a lot of the lamination across yeah. the winglet. So um, first off, yeah. the, wing pro the the actual flight profile is, is lost. So yeah. that was uh, a huge issue we ran into during manufacturing of the of the solar cells. Exactly. Well, we so vacuum bag them onto it, but yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, with the with the vacuum bag, it didn't uh, this uh, this side of the solar cells didn't uh, stick perfectly to the airflow, uh, to the top layer, or we're hoping that with the uh, ultra coat, it might help us. Yeah. Uh, and remember that carbon fiber, you never fly anything uncovered. You've seen the cars out there with these carbon fiber wings, and they look carbon fiber. That's actually not the way. You have to preserve the carbon fiber itself. You have to paint it, you have to gel coat it to preserve it. Otherwise, it'll delaminate pretty fast. Um, the second portion of the weight and balance, um, I would assume that your solar cells are the ones that have grown. I mean, did this thing fly? It was actually so, the tail. It was actually the tail. So well, when, we, when we first started the manufacturing, um, we wanted to use a foam core, and we left the foam inside the tail. Uh, but we did the horizontal tail with our first molded composite part, and it came out a lot heavier than we expected. And because the moment arm for the tail is so large, uh, it led to big balance issues. So. Like we said in the presentation, we're hoping to rectify it by extending the nose of the fuselage so that we can have a larger moment out towards the front. Um, we also took steps to lighten the tail so we can see the just as on the else. Big question for you guys, did it fly? Not, not yet. Not yet. We, not yet. I mean, as Wes suggested by our advisor, he told us not to destroy a $3,500 plane yeah. yet. So we want to fix it first and then we actually want to fly it. So technically, our, where our CG is right now is flyable. But we don't want to take the risk with the small characteristics of having it so far back. Yeah. Um, so we prefer to save the investment, do a proper fix before we fly it and possibly destroy our project. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> in the future, in the future it will fly, but we validated we it. We didn't want to rush this. We didn't want to rush All the control surfaces work perfectly. Uh, we've done some rough calculations to uh, balance the aircraft, and we're planning on to extend the fuselage to about uh, 9.5 inches. Good job. What was the logic for having some of the solar cells in serial and some in parallel? So we wanted to increase the current and voltage. So by doing series, we wanted to increase the voltage in the parallel. So each half of the wing is in series. So um, here, this end of the wing starts out as a positive side and runs all the way down to the solar panels, where it connects to this row, goes over, and then we have wires on the inside of the wing, which go back to this row and yeah. back over have to harness on the inside. Um, we're using a, what's called a MPBT, which is a solar charge controller, so it converts the voltage and current from the solar cells into the voltage and current of your battery. And then it has an intelligent circuit that monitors the load, so you have your motor directly connected to the MPBT. And basically when the load from the motor is lower than the power coming from the solar panels, some of that power is diverted to charge the battery. And when the load from the motor is higher than the solar panels can uh, supply, all of the load from the solar panels is diverted to the motor and some from the battery as well. So do you know which are your bad cells? Uh, yeah, some yeah, of them are, some really of them are a little cracked. <laughs> um, the, 
we actually tested a couple of these first. We were kind of worried because we cut the solar cells, and because they're monocrist plant, we kind of assumed that we would have to go with less solar panels on the wings because it would just completely break them. But we found that we uh, had conductivity. As long as we didn't crack the cells when we cut them, okay. we had enough generation from them. So uh, the cracked cells do have a little uh, decreased efficiency, but they do conduct through them. We tested them today and yesterday. And so. to be honest, we expected like, some of them to crack because they're very fragile. So we actually got, we said we we're going to put 50, so we actually got 80. And actually, we expect like 10 of the other ones. In the future, we're hoping to look into a molded design where the solar panels are incorporated into the mold for the wing so that they're all laid up at the same time. And that way we have a perfectly flush solar panel on the outside of the wing. Uh, and hopefully we don't have any residual stresses of having those panels after the wing is on the wing. Yep. So with the $1,500 you have left, what would you do to your plane right now? Uh, I think the biggest thing we would do is try to get molds cut out of aluminum. I know $1,500 is not that much, but we do have access to some manufacturing methods here uh, where you can possibly get discounts. Um, we do have a lot of excess carbon fiber and resin, so we wouldn't have to pay for more composite materials. But if we could reduce the weight and the um, well, reduce the weight of the wings and also increase the aerodynamic performance and efficiency uh, and the you know, shape and design, um, we could have a much higher performing aircraft. So like I said before, the wing loading ended up being around 20.8. Um, pounds per square foot, and if we could decrease the wing loading by half, they currently weigh around four and a half pounds each. Our wing loading could then decrease to our original calculation, which is around 13.8. So we have a much higher performing aircraft capable of fully sustainable flight.